Okay, this is part two of the session number 12 of the course on mathematical signal processing. And we are in the middle of some very abstract uh, discussion with certain operators taking limits within an abstract form of multiplication or so. But at the end, the main goal for, for next practical goal will be the Fourier inversion theorem. So how can we get back uh, for the original function from the Fourier transform. And if you do it with Lebesgue integration theory or L1 theory, you're uh, finding that the inverse Fourier transform is just the same as the Fourier transform, except that you're using a plus uh, in, uh, instead of the minus. This is very plausible because if you take the FFT, then the inverse Fourier transform up to some normalization is just a transpose conjugate. Remember, a matrix is called unitary if its, uh, its inverse is the same as the transpose conjugate. But as we will it, uh, verify, the Fourier matrix is a symmetric matrix. And the symmetry means that instead of just taking transpose conjugate, you just take the conjugate. So very often, you find some kind of vague arguments that because of this property, by taking limits in some vague sense, you're expecting that the inverse Fourier transform is like this. Also, in some um, engineering books, I found statements that um, the fact that it's not only called inverse Fourier transform, but um, that it is the inverse of the forward transform you can use formulas saying that the integral over exponential functions result in the Dirac delta. Now, I'm not sure if I have time in this course, but it's exactly the opposite. We have to have a mathematical proof which may justify such a magic formula, which is useful for applications, but that's not a proof, and it's not an argument. That's kind of, it's like the, the rules that you learn at school that multiplying pi with one over pi equals one. That's a trivial statement because the inverse element by definition does what it does, it cancels out the pi, but it doesn't tell you how to compute it and why it works. So maybe that's a too abstract statement, or but let me do it. Okay, now uh, what I would like to indicate to you is that here you see different things at the same time. So the first thing is the blue object, the triangular function which you have here. And for me, it was almost the most difficult part uh, to define the triangular function. So you could do it with an if statement and say it's one minus x on the interval from zero to one, and it's one minus x, I uh, want yeah, plus x in, in this part, or it's one minus absolute value x if you're in, in inside of minus one plus one, or you take the maximum of zero and one minus absolute of x. Whatever you're doing, you have a triangular function. Now I have a uh, dilation parameter, so I'm more or less showing you what the ST row is doing. Instead of a row, I put just R. So if R is equal to one, uh, you should get, uh, that's about here. Uh, sorry, no, it's R zero. Okay, I'm not sure, should, the label should be different. It should uh, give you the triangular function and I make it, well, the labeling is a little bit wrong. So for me, it would be a make it small row, we have a compression. So it goes to the Dirac and of course I cannot make it infinitely small. Now the triangular function can be shifted. So we move it around. Now what you see here is uh, while I'm shifting this and I'm only shifting to the positive direction, the other guy here, the brown guy is increasing the frequency. Now what you see here is actually the Fourier transform of the green guy is supposed to be the brown guy. And when I do a shift operator, I multiply the Fourier transform and that's the sinc square function. You see it's non-negative, it's going to zero. And uh, depending on how much I do the dilation, so I'm not sure about the labeling here, but if I take the original uh, function here, so it should, sorry, it should be one step above. Uh, be zero. Yeah, no, it, not, it shouldn't be zero, it should be called one. If I do not dilation, but I stretch by factor of one, I get the triangular function. 
Now, of course, I can also move that around and you see how the Fourier transform is getting more and more oscillations. Uh, but you should also see that this brown function, which is this one or black function, is having a zero at plus one, and then it goes up and has the next zero at two and three or so. We know that the sinc function is oscillating, going down and up and down. Sinc square actually has the value one here because one squared is one and it has all the zeros at integers. Now, what this demonstrates is if you're doing a shift of the original function, which is the triangular function, you will see an oscillatory effect and of course, I'm showing only the real part. I'm showing a cosine function. If you look what I'm done here, I multiply with a cosine and you see it's a cosine with parameter A and I'm changing the A. And uh, so essentially I'm, I have done the computation uh, kind of offline or um, as, as I was explaining it to you. So this is a pure illustration. And the main point is if I let the triangular function go to the Dirac on the free transform domain, something will go to higher and more and more like a, a, a long oscillating frequency. So in the extreme case, you wouldn't even see that it's decaying. Uh, I cannot do it here in, in this way, maybe a little bit more. And if you are changing the position, you're having a different frequency. So this is a result that we will use in our proof of the inversion theorem. But before I'm going back to this abstract uh, uh, principle of proof. Okay, I'm sharing uh, now the, there's the script again and hope it works. Yeah, so we had this abstract statement and uh, I don't go through all the details, but uh, you remember I was using uh, the fact that uh, M is continuous. And what I have to have to estimate is that you're giving me now generic elements of P1 and P2. I call them G and H, and there is some oper family of operators. And uh, you would like to know whether if you give me a uh, G H and ask me to measure the error in the B norm and the, to have the error at most epsilon, whether I can achieve it by just choosing the parameter alpha big enough. And of course, what we do is we are saying, okay, this is uh, would be okay if you look at the middle term, if you would replace the G by element from the dense subspace K, if you would replace the FH by some element F, and there you could go with alpha to the limit and may replace T alpha by T zero. So what are the kind of double triangle inequality or so? It's like going in a rectangle instead of horizontally from A to D, you go from A to B to C down to D. So we introduce an extra term and that's the term uh, that says, well, and that's where I, why I'm using this uh, bilinearity lemma. Replace both G and H by K and F. Then let's take the limit. And then of course, if we are now at T zero, you have to go back from T zero K F to T zero G H. Now, how can we achieve it? And it's very similar structural to what we have done here. The first thing is, well, we know, of course, that we can approximate arbitrary while I use again some eta and say, well, but here we have a T alpha. So what is uh, happening with the T alpha uh, K, which is comparable to the T alpha of G? Well, and then I'm saying, we are having made the assumption that the T alpha doesn't magnify. So in our proof before we were saying ST rho is not extending, the ST rho norm of in L1 is not changing. So here it's abstractly, it's just this magnification. Now it's correct, it's now it's T alpha of B. And then, so we have a control on this magnification, which is capital B times eta. And of course we do the same thing with uh, the different H minus eta. Now, once we have chosen those elements K and F such that the first term and the last term are fine, we have to concentrate on the middle term and we use uh, the lemma that allows us uh, to, no, sorry. The first and the third term can be controlled now uh, according to this estimate. And now we have switched to the elements where we know by assumption that we can do the limit transition from T alpha to T zero. 
but it's now for fixed K and fixed eta, uh, F. And so if you just put together, we, you see there are three times epsilon over three, you have a split of the difference that is actually interesting for us. Now this difference as difference to an intermediate term, and then you continue between further intermediate terms until you're getting T zero GH. And uh, if you put triangle, triangular inequality twice, you are getting exactly that uh, the difference between uh, this uh, together, put together is three times epsilon over three. So I just write here a simple combination of the last three estimates, you see three times epsilon over three is giving you the right required estimate. So I will have to do some fine tuning of the write up, but essentially you see it's nothing magic uh, done here. It's much more interesting to see where we have used already exactly this kind of strategy. So the first thing is, we have, how did we show that bounded measures act on C0? Well, the multiplicative thing, the bilinear form is mu convolved with F. And the claim was that we are ending up for starting from uniformly bounded continuous functions into uniformly. So even starting from C0, we were ending up in CUB. So we work with the supnorm, but we have this estimate. So you see capital B is not showing up, it's constant one. Now the proof we were using that the compactly supported measures, which are finite sum F for finite, are, have been the argument that we can, could use. And of course in C0 here, we use the compactly supported function. So what we were looking for is, oh, what can we say about a compactly supported measure convolved with a compactly supported function? And the answer is, well, it will be zero because then all these psi i, psi j's are not meeting anymore and we get a continuous function because it's uniformly continuous, but with compact support and that will end up in C0. And then we take the limits according to the lemma and we end up that we have the same inequality that we have here, also for the generic element for general measures, general C, um, uh, C0 functions and so on. So that's the harmless version of, of the, well, actually of the bilinearity theorem, not, not the complicated theorem, the first one. Now uh, I will go to the application of the more abstract theorem. Uh, and it's kind of a reproof of, of the ST row statement. So you see at the end, I'm getting ST row G convolved with F minus F goes to zero uh, under this condition. Now here I have to be a little bit more careful. So clearly we're convolving within L1. So the B1 is the same as the B2 and actually also the B, the target space, everything is L1. Now choosing dense, dense subspace, in both cases, it's the same. It's the continuous functions with compact support. And now comes this ST row. So the ST row operators, they are uniformly bounded. So again, the B equal one. And the limit you have to look at this is T zero is mu hat of zero times identity, which is the same as mu as a measure applied to the function constant one. So this is times uh, a convolution operator with the delta zero. So we're having, a, we should rather say ST rho um, is, the, is the compression operator and the T zero is, is something like this. So this is, uh, uh, what we have to look for. Uh, the bilinear form that we are using is, is convolution, of course, measures with, with functions. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure, I think this, this statement should be replaced by L1. So we have L1 is a closed subspace, I have to check this. But for the compactly supported functions, we have seen that the effect of the ST row is okay. And then we take the limit and so essentially I would say the abstract principle was distilled more or less from the proof that I gave for this approximate unit. You don't have to worry about details at the moment. I just want to show you that we are using the same argument over and over again. Now here you see something different, which is while well, we have measures, we know measures convolved with functions and we would like to discretize measures. So now it's, I think it's a little bit more interesting 
the T alpha, these operators turn measures into discrete measures by this discretization process. Remember this was like replacing a probability measure by a histogram where psi is the collection of the bin functions. So that would be a smeared version of bins. And, and then you would have experimental probability convolved with K is almost like the continuous limit of this uh, when you apply it to functions K. And so what are the ingredients? We are convolving measures with, with um, C0 functions. So we are choosing B1 to be the bounded measures. And we choose C1 to be the subspace of compactly supported measures. We know every measure is an infinite sum of the pieces. And if you take fine partial sums, they approximate in the measure norm. Of course, we choose compactly supported CC in C0. And then we have to prove that, yes, what can we say about this situation if, if you tell me that mu is a bounded measure with compact support? And if K is a continuous function with compact support. And then this abstract scheme will tell you, well, and then you take just limit in the right way and you can claim the same thing for any measure and you can claim it for any function K, which is in C0. Now, what is the advantage of having a measure with compact support? So you're measuring the mu applied to the Psi Js. Well, of course, if everything is living in a box, the discretization, the bins, maybe there are boundary bins, but let's say the, the, the Psi J's are only valid for J near the distance capital R to the origin, then the measurements, the bins, if you're taking inappropriate bins are a little bit larger like R plus one, but there are finitely many only of them. So you really get a finite discrete measure here and if you convolve it with the K, well, remember what is deep psi mu convolved with the function when I mean, any measure with the function is at the value of Y. The rule is, okay, I see I have to, uh, I've done a correction, so it should be K. So also here, this F should be K. I have to take the input function K, flip it, shift it, and then apply the measure. But we have already seen the deep psi mu of any input function is the same as mu applied to the spline approximation or so, and this spline approximation converge to the original function, or you can say we have already proved that this is convergent. So if you just evaluate it for a fixed value y, you evaluate it and you get this. So you see here what this means is with an elementary argument, um, you can prove that deep psi mu convolved with k is con pointwise convergent to mu convolved with k. Now, if you have pointwise convergence, then you can also find that you have uniform convergence over compact sets. So assume you know already that deep psi mu is supported in the set, f is or k is supported in the set. Only the interesting values are, let's say, in an interval from minus 20 to plus 20. Now, if you have pointwise convergence and you want to see that you're less than epsilon, then you choose, I don't know, 120,000 points or 500 points in that interval. You observe um, convergence at those points and in the in-between points, because they're all having, but due to the smoothness of F, the, the results are all uh, uniformly continuous, actually equicontinuous. They all have the same quality. So you can conclude from finite points to compact sets, I think I should add a proof of this argument. And But it's at the end, you find out, it's quite easy to find out that you have uniform convergence. Now, when you try to go from compactly supported measures to measures from compactly supported functions to all of C0, you have to use exactly such an argument. Recall that the deep psi mu is at most as big as the mu. So the deep psi operator is a non-expansive operator. It doesn't make measures bigger, or functionals bigger than the input measures. Now, this was the situation with the sup norm and a very similar situation happens with the L1 norm. Again, take CC now as a dense subspace of L1 and you have the same argumentation except uh, in the, the same key result actually, which is used 
but just using it for this. So this is something where you have a good thing. I realized in, this was kind of a curiosity that uh, I can uh, describe new uh, weak star conversions, which is quite important. We'll use it a lot in the future by uh, that you say a sequence of measures mu n is convergent to measure mu zero if you have mu n of f applied to mu zero of f. You can test it only if, you, if the sequence mu n is a bounded sequence, then it's enough uh, to test it for individual in, uh, functions with compact support or so. And um, it's quite plausible and easy to show that if you have mu n is weak star conversion, then also that discre any discrete version, discretized version is convergent or so. But I found it interesting with the same kind of abstract machinery or so uh, to say, well, but if you uh, know that all the, for each pupu, each discretization operator, you have observed that it's convergent, can you then say that also the limiting operator mu n is convergent to the limiting operator mu zero? And yes, uh, this can be done and I have given a proof which I don't want to give, but you see here is kind of, you're going from mu and f uh, to mu zero of f, that's what you want to make small. And you have the discrete operator, which you pulled over to the spline operator. So you have again, three terms and you make each of them small appropriately. And then that's, that's all what you need. Now, uh, I also uh, found that the fundamental relationship uh, for the Fourier stiltis transform can be verified in the same way. We will not use it for a while and so I just indicate it. It can be rewritten as the following kind of funny formula, the red one. You are giving me two bounded measures. We know that they have a Fourier transform in the sense of Fourier stiltis transform. So you apply a new hat of S is new as a measure applied to the character minus at minus S. And then this is a bounded continuous function and therefore you can apply the measure mu and we can switch roles. So kind of this is a funny kind of game symmetry in the, in the Fourier stiltis transform or so. And uh, again, whereas for function spaces like C0, you argue with the simple functions, continuous functions with compact support. For measures, you approximate them first by compactly supported measures but sometimes it's also interesting to approximate the, by discrete measures. We've seen they can be used to approximate. So if you see such a thing, then you should ask yourself, and at the end of the course, I hope that you can do such a proof yourself. Can I prove it myself? Well, then the suggestion is what happens if mu equals delta x here? And if uh, nu is delta y, can, can I prove it in this case? So um, so this is a good exercise uh, for, for all these terms. What is mu uh, applied to new hat? Of course, I see a typo now. Uh, so you should write um, uh, delta at s probably or so, yeah. So it's, uh, but so if mu is delta x, you take delta x, yeah, it, you should write delta s. Then the free transform with Dirac is a character with a minus. So yeah, please nu equals delta s, or I should better write here chi of minus y. Now, what is the evaluation of a pure frequency with frequency minus s? This is e to the two pi i minus s times x. And I write it as a minus, and then I have s with x. But here's the symmetry of the Fourier matrix. This is the same as X with S. So in the multi-dimensional case, it's color product, but also that doesn't depend on the order. In the one dimensional case, it's really S with X. And now you read it backwards and you're saying, well, this is the same as Delta of S applied to the free transform of Delta X, which is the pure frequency with a negative minus here. So it's true for deltas. Now, if it's true for deltas, it will be true for finite discrete measures by taking linear combinations of deltas. But it's also true for absolutely convergent sums. And we know that if you give me any measure, discretized version deep psi mu, and now instead of using heads, I'm writing 
applied to the Fourier transform of this bounded measure d psi nu must be d psi nu applied to a norm switching the role and take the Fourier transform of the discrete version of mu. So it's just starting from a trivial statement that e to the minus two pi i s x equals e to the minus pi i x s. So it's switching the early order gives you already this quite relevant statement or so. Now uh, I'm not going through details, but the argument is really, the possible argument is, well, what if we take a limit of um, maybe you, you prefer to take phi and psi different partitions of unity or so here, but let's now take the limit d psi nu, and you will find it goes to nu. Now again, you could argue that if mu has compact support and d psi mu is uh, also having all the joint compact support. So what you need is only that the argument here, this free transform of the deep sign nu, has to converge uniformly over a compact set to f of nu. And that's what we, we have already, or we'll uh, use, uh, get in a different context or so. If you are taking a general measure, then you have to look at the tails or so. And Okay, so, you're doing this here. And in the same way, you have to say now, I'm taking the Fourier transform of this here, and you replace on the outer side, um, the, the deep sign nu, which was here to nu. Here you would use that this here is uh, mostly concentrated. Now that, that the nu is concentrated on a compact set. So you can uh, ignore the effect of this not uniform convergence at infinity, but you need only local version. So here maybe you're saying, assume that mu and nu both have compact support, then this limit is justified and repeating the same argument now with changing the roles, you replace deep psi mu by mu and everything is done. Okay, uh, you see I'm in the middle of working out more details or so. Uh, and maybe one more abstract argument, then I should finish for, for the, all this abstract stuff. If we are, uh, if we are uh, having two Banach spaces, in our case, it will be, for example, the free algebra and the C0 space. And if you have an embedding of the first one into the second as a dense subspace, then also the dual space um, can be embedded of the second one can be embedded into the first one. So if you think of small and big, if you embed a small space into a big space, then the dual space will be kind of having the opposite inclusion result. Well, what does it mean a continuous embedding? Well, it means that everything from the big space is contained in the small space, but uh, if you control the, the norm in the big space after the embedding, this embedding is continuous. So I would say F is the embedded version throwing the element of the subset into the set itself. So it's like identity operator mapping from B1 into B2. That's what you have here. It's continuous if you have this constant. So this is quite often easy to prove in all the concrete cases. But if you have two Banach spaces, with their natural norms, then um, usually by a close graph argument or so, so, or by explicit estimates, you have this kind of continuous embedding. Now, this clearly means that every linear functional that you have on the big space can be restricted to the small space. So you are giving me a sigma, which is a linear functional in the, in the, in the big space and you're applying it to an element from the small space. So like the F in B1. And then you will say, well, but the elements of the small space are in the big space. So you, of course you can estimate as the definition more or less of this constant. This is the best possible uh, constant that you can put in an estimate of the form, how big is the action in going into the complex numbers of the linear functional on F compared to what the input size was with this F. But this is controlled by a constant time B1. So you have to write C times this no element here times the B1. And of course, I was moving the C over here to this side because I would like to have an estimate of the form some constant times this. 
And because uh, the definition of what is a functional norm, it's the optimal constant, it's a soup, but the, in reality it means it's an optimal constant for such estimate. This is a legitimate constant, therefore the optimal constant will not be larger. So this is kind of why you have the embedding. So where have we used the... Uh, Okay, I will answer the question right now. So the first question is, where did we use the, the, uh, the density of B1 and B2? And the answer is, well, at the place where we are talking about embedding. What we are saying here is just every functional on the big space defines a functional on the small space. And because it's an abstract argument, it's always good to have a concrete example. I mean, what could you do in finite dimensions? Take R3, the XYZ space, and take as a subspace the plane. So it's clear that if you give me um, um, a vector in the plane with coordinates X, Y, zero, and you give me a functional, which is a row vector in R3, and you take a scalar product of your row vector from R3 with your vector X, Y, zero as a column vector, you're getting, let's say the, the row vector is set one, set two, set three. You're getting set one times X, set two times Y and zero. But this would be a situation where, um, first of all, I mean, the plane is not dense in R3, obviously, but the third component wasn't used. So there are many different functionals on the big space R3, which have the same effect on the original space on the plane. So if you have a situation like this, you would take a quotient so that dual space of the small space would be a quotient. But here we have the density and that's what we can write here. If somebody says, well, I, I found two functionals, sigma one and sigma two, they coincide on the subspace. Are they the same as elements of the smaller space? And the answer is yes, they have to be because assume they're only Convergent, I mean, equal on the subspace. So on the sequence Fn, you can exchange sigma one for sigma two. But because of the density, you can give me any F in the big space, you approximate Fn in the big space. And because it's a linear functional, you can approximate it uh, and you get sigma one of F, but on the right hand side, you get sigma two of F. So two linear functionals, which are bounded continuous functionals are equal as functionals in the B2 sense, in the large sense, if and only if they are coinciding on a dense subspace. Now, the question that came up is, is also are the dual spaces dense in each other? And the answer is, if you take the norm, then they are not dense. If you're uh, taking the weak star topology, the answer will be yes. So um, you can take a, a good example is, uh, Later on, if you think of sequence spaces, I, as I say it in words, you take little l1 um, in, uh, and little l2. So absolutely summable sequences are inside the square summable sequences. And it's a dense subspace, not a, it's a proper dense subspace. Each space has a norm. Now, if you take the dual space, the l2 is a Hilbert space. So all the linear functionals, it's like Rn, it's an infinite dimensional Rn are row vectors, so to say, with infinite, uh, with, with, which are square symbols, finite infinite length, infinite length uh, finite lengths in the Euclidean sense. If you take L1, the dual space is L infinity. So if you take the closure of the dual of the small guy, which is L2, you're getting C0. The sequence is tending to zero with the supnorm. If you're looking at the full dual, you're getting uh, the L infinity. But if you take in this situation, the weak star convergence is point-wise convergence or coordinate-wise convergence. Yes, of course, the guy that you cannot approximate it with summable or square summable sequences would be, for example, constant one. All of them are decaying at infinity and uh, in L2, so you are never having uniform approximation. But weak star convergence turns out to be exactly the convergence uh, coordinate-wise. So just take plateau functions, you take, um, let's say on the, on the integers, you take 500 ones, then you take 3000 ones, then you take 5 million ones. And any person, even the person sitting at coordinate number 350,000, 
after a while he would get a one and he would be happy and would say, yes, I observe convergence. So you have pointwise convergence in the coordinate wise sense. And that's exactly abstractly speaking, weak star convergence, but it's not uh, density in this sense. Okay, I think we have done so much abstract theory that I would like to jump back or over to the others. Uh, note. I hope I can find it now. Yeah, it's this here. So I was showing at the beginning already uh, this plot. Uh, this is a file which I have created and I will extend it uh, more and more, but it it's essentially grew out of the situation that you're experiencing probably now, that you have seen there are several function spaces and how are they related to each other and so on. And uh, I would like to explain this to you. So the rule was that I was trying to make a symbol which is related to the unit ball. If you take these LP norms, L1 norm, sup norm or so in the Euclidean space. So recall that the L1 norm in, in the plane would be, well, the size of a vector is just X absolute value, X1 absolute value plus Y absolute value. The unit ball would be a Karo shape. But I also would want it to do, and that's inspired by the spectrogram that we will indicate later on, which describes the Fourier transform quite well, that the symbol of the Fourier transform of the same image, of the same space should be a rotation by 90 degree. And so I'm using now this vertical high rhomb for L1 and the horizontal one for the rotated version, which is L1. I also try to start more and more to use a color code. So this is one of the older pictures. Uh, and uh, the, the kind of the square that you see here uh, should indicate that we have C0. So that's the rectangle of this space. So it's like uh, the if the maximum of two coordinates is, is at most one, then you will see a cubic uh, a square going from minus one to plus one in horizontal and vertical way. So we have I've deformed it a little bit. Now you see another rectangle of the same form and that would be the CB. So we have the bounded continuous function. If you would like, you can have the uniformly bounded continuous function in between. And later on, we will see L infinity outside. So these are different spaces each of them closed in the, in the other spaces, but all of them would be the spaces having the subnorm. So by indicating C0 and CB, we indicate they have the same norm, but they are not equal because they are, one is a little bit bigger than the other one. Now, my symbol for L1 is the smaller of those rhombs. And we have seen that L1 is a subspace of the bounded measures. So that's why I'm choosing now a slightly bigger symbol for the bounded measures. Now, what I uh, want to indicate is each set of each function space, so to say, and I'm mostly considering function spaces which have a norm. So that's the natural norm that we have already, um, should be represented by a symbol such that small spaces embedded into larger spaces have symbols which are planar sets which are smaller. So by taking the intersection, and that's the yellow area, L1 intersected C0, I'm intersecting this horizontal rectangle with the L1 shape. So I'm getting a hexagonal shape. And what this should demonstrate is to you that this is not contained in the free algebra. So the free algebra is this element here. So uh, what, what you see here is there are elements in the yellow domain which are outside of the Fourier algebra rhomb. So kind of that's what you have here. Later on, you will we will see, for example, that yes, if a function is integrable and bounded, it will be square integrable. So my symbol of a circle will be going around the yellow area or so. What you also see is that this rhomb, the horizontal rhomb, which is FL1, the Fourier algebra, is inside the rectangle. This is my way of representing the Riemann-Lebesgue uh, Riemann lemma. And of course, I could have put 
the Fourier stiltis transform of bounded measures, and it would touch, I mean, it would not stay inside C0, and that's a little bit difficult. It would be parallel to this, but it would be inside the big rectangle, but not inside the small. So you see, I mean, two-dimensional situation is a little bit tricky. Uh, we spent a lot of time on finding it out. Now, uh, this is another picture, and I will just go through these pictures. We will see that the inversion theorem, and because we had so much technicalities today, I will do that next time, next Tuesday, uh, that the inversion theorem is allowing us to recover the function from its Fourier transform. Well, what is the natural situation for people in Lebesgue integration theory? They would say, we have the integral transform. We start with L1, and then we say, we need the Fourier transform also to be integrable. Now, because then you can apply the Fourier inversion theorem, and the, Fourier in, the inverse Fourier transform turns out to be, because of our normalization of the two pi, this, this will be exactly the ordinary Fourier transform with the change of sign, so combined with the flip operator. So if I take all the Fourier transforms, which are also L1 functions, I'm getting exactly the domain for the Fourier transform. So in this example, it's the dark blue area. And this dark blue area, of course, is Fourier invariant. You are allowed to rotate it by 90 degree. Um, I'm also using, yeah, okay. But I also see that, that in the outside, you would have the what was the yellow area before. So the blue is inside L1 with C0. We will also discuss what is called Venus algebra. That's essentially the subspace of Riemann integrable continuous functions. And then you can do the same thing, kind of the Fourier inversion theorem proved not with the abstract integrals or with the technical integrals of Lebesgue, um, but with ordinary Riemann integrals. And then you would get an area which I was depicting here with the light blue area. Later on, I realized it's maybe better to use as a complete square or so, at least some object which you can rotate by 90 degrees without uh, changing it. Now, the main point of which I tried to, to reach uh, maybe in uh, one week from now, or, or I mean, uh, second week from now, is there is a subspace which is useful and dense inside all of these spaces, which is almost like L2, but consisting of decent continuous functions. So this is the space where you can periodize, sample, all, or do all the things, compute, fully transform using discrete versions of um, the DFT or the FFT and so on. So this will be the, the space that we use. And uh, so if you want to know where it is, then, then you know it's, it's the space in the, in the middle. Now, uh, this is maybe uh, another picture that should help you with the orientation. We will, uh, we will have this small space inside, and you can imagine that, and that's why my last argument came in. If you have a small space, then it will have a big dual space. If you have in between the small space and its dual, somehow really in between in a, in a very concrete sense, um, you have the space which is equal to its dual, which is the L2 space, so it's this here. And then you have, uh, uh, I don't know, C0 and L1 and so on. So this is roughly speaking the situation. So in between, we need some of these spaces. Some of the spaces are actually appearing quite naturally in the literature, but uh, yeah. Okay, maybe uh, I should mention here that uh, usual distribution theory makes use of the short space of rapidly decreasing function using a script S symbol. So these are infinitely differentiable functions where each derivative, each partial derivative is decaying in a good way. That space is fully invariant. It's quite uh, cumbersome to use it. The so-called nuclear Frechet space. So it's technical. But if you want to see where, where you can find it, you are having this picture that I was using already. Namely, it's inside of my favorite object and the dual space is therefore outside. So people doing partial differential operators, they have to re re refer to this. It's uh, made, um, well, actually it's a 
a graph of a trigonometric polynomial. So it's an epicycle. And I made it with 24 cycles, if I remember correctly. So if you rotate it by 90 degree, you're just changing it by, by some angle. So this is really the space of temper distribution under the extended Fourier transform is okay. And it's true because the pre-dual in this space is okay. But I will avoid this theory because it's rather technical. And, uh, but with this kind of round object, you're much better off. Now what was dark blue is now dark red in this uh, domain and you see what, how things go. Uh, I can go on for a long time. Maybe I'm trying to, yeah, to show you one more thing. I'm not sure if it's coming up. So uh, we will do the Plushell theorem. Yeah, okay, maybe a uh, step in the direction of what will come up also soon is the Wiener algebra. These are the absolutely Riemann integrable functions. So clearly they have to be um, bounded and continuous, but they're also integrable. But this object is not fully invariant. And uh, yeah, this is my more recent version of this picture. So if you take that object and you rotate it by 90 degree, you're getting something which is inside the domain where you have the Fourier inversion theorem. But this is the part where you can prove the Fourier inversion theorem uh, with, with um, Riemann integrals only. So this is kind of where we live. But all this contains, and maybe I'm just finishing with this figure now, all this is uh, contained in a uh, containing S0. So roughly speaking, S0 is stands here and here and here and here and in C0. It's only weak star dance in the big space or so, but if you understand what's going on here, you are very happy. And in this space, we will be able to approximate everything by samples. So very often you would say, oh, I'm interested in the Fourier transform of a function. Let's take the samples, let's take a Fourier transform, let's look at the shape of the Fourier transform. And if you do it properly, you can really understand a lot about the integral Fourier transform. If you do it not properly, you have a lot of extra rules and you believe that the discrete Fourier transform is behaving quite differently from the ordinary one, which is, from my point of view, is nonsense. S0 is a good tool, it's uh, um, a nice space, and we will get a big space of distributions which contains not only the Dirac, but also Dirac combs and other things. So within this space, we can do Fourier transform for periodic measures, for uh, discrete measures, which are not decaying, and all these things are living here. And we will see that at the end of the of story, there is just one convolution, which we can extend in different formats. There's just one Fourier transform, and you can go from one to the other. And that's a little bit different from the abstract point of view, I meaning the viewpoint of abstract harmonic analysis, which says you can do Fourier transform on the real line on the Euclidean space RD, on the torus, that's classical Fourier series or representation theory. You can do it discreetly. You have the discrete Fourier transform and you need, I don't know, six different chapters for periodic signals, for periodic discrete signals, for non-periodic continuous signals, for multi-dimensional signals, but except from the dimension D, we can do everything uh, in, in such a picture. And we will see that sometimes we cannot apply an integral to L2, for example, because L2 is, uh, contains the sync function. It's in L2, but not in L1. So we have to be careful with Lebesgue integration theory, but we have to do approximation. And that's why these abstract theorems have been so important to, to do. Okay, I thank you for your attention and we'll stop the recording now.